let us remain standing just a moment for prayer. Our dear beloved Father, it's with grateful hearts that we come in the name of the Lord Jesus to thank Thee for all that Thou hast done. And we pray that You'll bless our gathering together this afternoon. We thank Thee for this gallant testimony of our brethren, how out of darkness into the marvelous light that Thou hast brought him. And we pray for our dear brother, that You'll help him and bless him in every way, and his little wife and baby. Be Thou with us this afternoon in the Word. Save sinners and heal the sick. For we ask it in Christ's name, amen. You be seated. And now, my associate, Brother Moore, with the scripture. From the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, again, the 36th verse throughout the chapter. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who... And what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say all. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. I'm not mistaken. Is this Brother Outlaw sitting right up here? The Lord bless you, Brother. I'm glad to see you up there. I just recognize you from down at the platform. Heard your mother or somebody's been very sick that night. We're in prayer for her that she'll be made well. And we are happy to have all the rest of you in this afternoon, uh, this little gathering. And I am um, got to hear the most of my, uh, our brother's testimony, or part of it, when I come in. And I tell you, when I heard it this morning down to Brother Ballard's church and how that he was spiritually led to the church seeking me to have prayer for him, how the Lord did that, he, no one knew I was going down there, Brother Ballard didn't himself. And we just felt led to go down there, and there the Lord was. And a young Catholic boy on the platform last night was said was told that he was, had a tumor in the brain and was doctors said he was going to die. And how that he had um, been uh, prayed for on the platform, he was somehow strangely led to that place this morning. We had a wonderful time. <clears throat> now, you full gospel people, many of you can't understand. Was that the boy raised his hand just then? The Indian boy. Yes, brother. God bless you. Are you feeling better? You feel that's very good. That's fine. We're thanking God for them. And uh, so we're just. Hoping and trusting and believing with all of our hearts that you and your lovely little wife and your baby can go in and give a testimony to the power of the Lord Jesus is our sincere prayer and our belief. When I heard this Baptist brother that just spoke, what he had come through, 
So you full gospel people, well, you hear someone give a testimony, that might not mean too much. Of course, you appreciate it. But I know where the boy is standing. I come up out of the same tribulation, and I know what it means to step out with real, true faith with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I remember what they told me when I went and told them I'd received the Holy Ghost. Dr. Davis said to me, Billy, you need a rest. Go home. There's something wrong with you. He said, you've seen a nightmare. I said, I've seen an angel. Yes, sir. He said, and you with a grammar school education is going to preach the gospel around the world. I said, that's what he said. And that's what I'll do. And I did it by God's grace. Now listen, this boy here, he needs an arm and a hand. You know, he's in... So you give it to him, brother. He really needs it now. Somebody to take him in. He's, he's come out from there to stand out for the full thing of God and to believe on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, believe on Jesus Christ and the, the signs and wonders and miracles. He's come out to be our brother. Now let's show him we're, we're his brother too in appreciation. God bless him is my sincere prayer. And I hear that the little lady is to be mother again right away and just an ousting like that has got him wearied and upset and, and everything and he had... A nervous condition, stomach trouble. We prayed this morning. I'm sure God heard. The Lord bless them is my sincere prayer. And to the little lady. She's come from tribulations too, from an opera singer to come down to be a servant of God. I'm so happy for that. I pray that God will richly bless them. I suppose the mayor has sent me the key to the city. <laughs> <laughs> I just seen it laying there, Brother Outlaw, and I thought it might be the key to the city. I didn't know. I suppose it isn't, though. But what I want is the key to the Scripture. The Holy Spirit. Now, today, we've got a little drama that the Lord has placed on my heart for this afternoon. And I want you to be real quiet for a few moments and listen. Now, we're going to get out early enough, the Lord willing, so that those who can come back tonight, now I understand that some of them was looking for this to be the closing service. Many strangers in the city wanted service tonight also. If your pastor desires you to be at your church tonight, hasn't closed, that's your duty to be at your, your post tonight. That's right. No people away from their churches. You've got your church. Now, when this is all over, we want you to go back to your church. Go back to your church where you come from. Take right on and be a better Christian if you can be. And all the converts that's been in the meeting, try them that's in the neighborhood. Visit them and bring them in to your church to have fellowship with you. That's what the revival's for. Rejoice with those who's been healed. And always remember me in your prayer. Now... There seems to be something wrong with our story this afternoon. As we look at it, there just seems to be not the right kind of a, of a sound to the voice that speaks. How could these Pharisees love Jesus? They hated him. Why, they had nothing to do with this man called Jesus. He tore up their churches and everything else. Why, they despised him. And how could this Pharisee ever ask him down to his house for dinner? We usually invite people who we love to eat with us. You know, like somebody that you, that you appreciate. There's something about eating with each other. That's the reason we have the Lord's Supper. It's the fellowship around the Lord's Supper, what makes it so great to us. But how could this Pharisee invite Jesus to his house as the old wicked world saying he had a, something up his sleeve? He had some kind of a selfish motive. The word Pharisee means actor. The very word Pharisee means an actor. 
And an actor is a mimic or an impersonator. And how well that does fit our modern word of hypocrite. An actor, an impersonator, somebody who's trying to be something, as Congressman Upshaw used to say, when you're trying to be something that you hate. The late congressman that was healed in her service after being in a wheelchair for 66 years, he used to say that, don't be nothing that you hate. That's Southern. But this Pharisee had invited Jesus. Now, they had no fellowship together, so there must be some kind of a selfish motive. They had nothing in common to talk about. You know, we middle-aged men, we have things in common. We like to meet with people of our age and talk. When you see a little girl about five years old hanging around Grandma, there's something wrong. Grandma's got a sack of candy sitting somewhere. It's too much difference in their age. They can't have things in common. The little children have things in common. They... They talk each other's language about their dollies and about their tops are spinning and the little boys. The Bible says in Isaiah, the little children playing in the street, they have things in common. The young ladies, they have things in common. They like to meet and talk about their boyfriend and, you know, and they have things in common. And the other ladies, you know, they have things in common. They like to meet and talk, meet and talk. <laughs> so they just have things in common. Well, the man does the same. The Kiwanis in the city, they like to meet together, have a little dinner and talk over the business of the city, how they can feed the poor and little things that should be done. The Kiwanis has things in common, the lodges, and Christians have things in common. That's what we're out here for this afternoon. We got things in common. We've got something that we're all interested in. If it wasn't, we'd be out in the parks or out on the highway. But we got things in common. We want to talk about Jesus. For well, that's what we have in the common grounds today among us is the Lord Jesus. We never come out here just to be seen. We come out here to talk about Jesus. And we come to fellowship around His Word and with His people. That's what we're here for. But how could this Pharisee every invite Jesus, who he hated, to come down and have dinner with him. And it must have been late in the afternoon, I suppose just as the going down of the sun, and the sun setting, and Jesus was tired, he had been preaching all day, and perhaps a hoarse voice, and, and from speaking, and his face burning from the direct rays of the Palestinian sun. And as our story starts, I can see a young man, sweaty all over, his legs are sweaty and dusty, and he's standing outside of the great ring of people, pressing up on him to hear the word. And, you know, I've heard many good preachers. And how I love to hear good preaching. I don't get the privilege of doing it very much, but I love to hear a good preacher who knows the Word. But oh, how it must be to hear him say something. Just one word from him would trill our hearts beyond any voice that we ever heard. And how the people must have pressed on him to hear the word. 
And as we look down to one side, I see this young man, tired, quivering from fast running, sweat all over his body, standing on his tiptoes, looking up. Oh, he says, that's him. That's him. For I never heard a man speak like that. You see, he had been detached. And had been sent out by his great rich pastor to find Jesus. It must have been a relief for him when he found him. He had went into one place and to the other and find that he was not here. He had gone somewhere else. But a few days before that, his rich master who lived in another city was a great man in that city. He had great influence. And people had great respect for him. And I can see him now. These Pharisees was a long ways from being poor men. Some of them was exceedingly rich. They got the tithings and the offerings and the cuts from the sacrifice. And they were rich men. And they were looked up to. And they had to live an honest life. And respected. As a clergyman in the city. But may I say this. That with all that which is all right. But if your heart isn't right with God. You're not nothing in the eyes of God yet. No matter how religious. How respected, how good a name you have, how honest you are, doesn't mean one thing in the eyes of God. We're watching this Pharisee. And I can see him as he walks back and forth in the great quarters of his home. I'm Dr. So-and-so in this city. You know, I'm... I'm a, I'm a well-respected citizen. What I say is the law and order. I'm a great man. And when you get to thinking that in your heart, then you're a nothing that you ought to be, says the Bible. When a man thinks he's just a little bit better than somebody else, you're on your road out, brother. That's right. We're all the same in the sight of God. Rich, poor, brown, black, white, yellow, whatever we may be. We're all on one equal basis with God. And when this self-styled Pharisee walked up and down the floor and said, You know, I believe I'll put on a great big party down here. You know, if I could just put on a big party, cause all the people to talk about it, I would get probably in the front page of the paper or in the society column, if there was such a thing. Now, as we dramatize this, we're going to use names and so forth, which may seem just a little strange. To get the principle, the message that I want you to hear. And as this Pharisee walked up and down his floors, he thought, Now, if I could only do something that would cause the people to know that I'm a great person. We see that same thing today. People wanted to put on a show that the outside would look at them. That somebody would think they would be big. They want the biggest meeting or the biggest this or the something on the, the better dressed crowd coming to their church. The biggest church. The highest people. The best uh, pews. Something big. What we need is more God and not so much of the world. He that will humble himself, God will exalt. But humbleness has to come first. 
And we watch this Pharisee as he walks up and down the floor. And he's trying to think. Oh, if I could only think of some way now that I could get somebody for a drawing card. If I could only think of somebody or something that I could put on a big show with. And all at once I can see him as he rubs his little chubby hands together and he puts his hand on his little roly poly stomach. And he says, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's the very idea. Not only will I be great before the people of the city, but I'll be great amongst the other Pharisees, the pastors of this city. You know what I'll do? I'm going to send over and invite that fellow called Jesus of Nazareth, that holy roller, and I'm going to get him down here and expose that guy. Because Pharisee Levinsky just told me the other day that he knew that he wasn't no prophet. And we know he's not. And we know he's only deceiving the people. So I believe I'll just stand and invite him to come down. And when I get all the other Pharisees in, then we'll just expose that stuff. I know when the state president and all of them gets together, we'll sure trim him down. If I could only get him to come. Oh, if he'll come, it'll just be a wonderful thing. Courier, come here. Take out to the country. Find this Galilean prophet, so-called, and tell him to come down to my house. I'm giving him a great big spread down here. I'll feed him well. He don't get to eat very much, I'm sure. But I'll really give him a good feed if he'll come down. Tell him to come down and see me. Well, the courier, to do this, he tuck out across the country. And we find him here looking at his heart much have just been satisfied when he said, that must be the man. I don't believe anybody could ever see Jesus and ever fail to know who he was. He's different from all other men. And as a courier, as he notices everybody swarming around Jesus, as they swarm around him, and it's just setting of the sun. He elbows his way through the crowd. And he bumps into a line that's around the Lord Jesus. He stumbles up against somebody and starts to break through the line. There's a gentleman lays his hands on him and says, Sir, you cannot go inside the line. Our master has just got through speaking. Oh, he's so tired. I'm sorry, but we just can't let you go in. Who was this fellow? It could have been Philip. And then he said, But, kind sir, I have an important message for him. I just must see him. For I have a message from my master that I've been for several days chasing him around through Galilee. And now I have found where he's at and I must do it, sir. I'm tired and I'm weary, but I, I must just say one word. Will you be so kind as to help me to get to him? I can hear Philip say, certainly, I see that you get to say this word. I can see Philip take him by the hand, walk up and say, Master, this young man says he has a message for you from his master. Would you have a moment's time to say a word to him? I can see Jesus bow his head. Yes. There's nobody ever asked Jesus anything but what got an answer. He's always willing to answer. And the courier, as he looked at Jesus, knowing he was standing in the presence of him, he gave him the invitation. And told him that his Pharisee master wished to see him. Oh, I can see a great big fellow rush up by the name of Peter. No, Lord. Certainly not. You can't have nothing to do with them people. 
There's a rabbit in the woodpile somewhere. They've got something up their sleeve. You're too busy. Your schedule calls for this and this and thus and thus. You just can't go down to see that Pharisee. After all, they haven't got no use for you. You see how they treat you. You can't go to such a person as that. But you know, he was the Word of God. Ask and you shall receive, regardless of who you are, what your state is. I can see Jesus politely say to the young man, Go tell your master I'll be there on such and such a date. I'll be there. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, it'll be open. Ask, ye shall receive. For every one that asks, receives. Every one that knocks is open to him. Every one that seeks, find. Oh, if we could seek for him. And knock at his door with that kind of a faith that believing that he would hear an answer. But then the courier, as soon as he had got his word from that Jesus would be there, oh, he was so excited, he turns around and rushes away. How could he do it? How could he do it? Think who he's standing before. Oh, I wish I could take his place. He was so carried away with the duties of his master, he failed to recognize that he was in the presence of God. I think that's the whole lot of we couriers today. We preachers. We are so carried away with our denominations with our little groups until many times we fail to recognize when we're in the presence of God. Oh, I wish I could get to Him like that. I wish I could have come to Him and talked to Him before I ever would have presented some earthly need. I would have fell on my face and said, Jesus, be merciful to me. Little maybe did that courier recognize that one day that's going to be his judge. We do the same thing. We're so took up with little factions and little things of petty understandings among us and so forth till we fail to recognize the very God that's in our midst. We do it. It's too bad. But we do. And then I notice as he hurries away, I don't know how he did it, because he had other things on his mind. Oh, he thought he had done something great because he had found who his master sent him after, not realizing that he had done the worst thing he ever could do to be in the presence of Christ and not worship him and ask forgiveness. And for mercy. Notice, he hurries back down and tells his master, I found him, and he promised he would be here. Oh, how that pleased that little fat Pharisee. I said, you know, now I'll make arrangements for the feast. I'll set the, all my tables out here under this great veranda. The grapes will be ripe at that time. And if you ever was in the Orient or the Eastern country, how they can really put on the dog, as we call it. And there's no, there's no middle class of people there. There's either the rich or the poor. And the rich has everything and the poor has nothing. And how he's going to cook and barbecue the lambs and how the outsiders would stand around and lick their lips and everything, couldn't get a bite of it. And, but he could do it. He was rich. He could put it on. Now let's look at him. As he's in this great mood, 
He gets everything ready for this visitation. And after he got everything ready, the day finally arrived that Jesus was to appear. He had enough confidence to believe he'd be there. So he got all of his sheep killed and his ox and so forth. The very best of cooks. Oh my, how they can cook. They can barbecue that lamb. And I'm telling you, it sure is delicious. Cook those great big roasts on the outside on this big turning spindle so you can smell it for a mile. And oh, he got everything ready and the day finally arrived. I can see him have his floors all repolished and the very best robe on. He has sent out all of his invitation to all of his pastoral friends and everything to come in to see. And the great joke of it was they were going to have Jesus there. That was a joke. They were going to have a big time out of this guy as he was uneaten. Then they got, these Pharisees had a lot of flunkies. You call them servants here. They had flunky for everything they wanted done. They had a little flunky to do it. So the barns was all fixed for those who come in carriages to put away their horses. Everything was just at the hand for the great feast to come. Then we see, after a while, up drives a great big carriage. And when the horses are stopped out there by a flunky, and then this Pharisee gets out, and he's just as welcome. There's a flunky there at the gate to welcome him in. There's a little place at the gate. And the first thing this Pharisee does, or ever who is a visitor, it's the compliments of the host. To have a little place there before you come in for a foot wash. The most of the Palestinian people, they, they're, the way they visit and the way they got their transportation was by walking in those days. And as they walked, they had the Palestinian garment as an underneath garment. And then a robe over that. And the Palestinian garment is down to the knees. And as they walk, the robe, twisting like this, uh, picked up the dust. And the dust and the perspiration on the limbs caused the dust to stick. And they walked over the dusty roads where animals traveled. And the animals along the road with the droppings and so forth, they got into the dust. And when the dust picked up and got onto the legs, it stuck on the legs and the perspiration. It created a horrible odor, like in the stable, as they walked. So they was coming to be a guest. They was not presentable. Because they smelt with the, the odors from the road. So we've read in the Bible of the feet washing. So the lowest paid flunky of all the flunkies he had was the feet wash flunky. Because he had to wash the feet. And when the guests come, he sat down the first thing before he entered in. The little hall, the little corridor. And they wore sandals in those days. He slipped off his sandal, sandals and he got some water. And he washed his feet and leg real good and taken all the stench out of the road off. And then when he did that, he set his sandals up and wiped them out good. And then he, the courtesy of the host brought him a pair of cloth shoes he could wear in his house. So he slipped on the cloth shoes. Now his feet's washed. And now he has on cloth sandals. Then as he enters into the next door, there's a man standing there who has some ointment, some oil. And the reason they did that for both men and women... Them direct rays of the Palestinian sun cooked the neck, just browned it in the face. It was worse than what uh, Arizona is, I suppose. So as they come in, there was a man stood there who they held out his hands, and he gave him some oil, and he oiled it over his hands, put it on his face, back behind his neck, and then he gave him a towel, and he wiped the oil off. And when he wiped it off from his neck and from his hands, 
That all had an odor about it. A beautiful odor. A real fragrance. What it was, it was made out of a certain little apple. The apple of a rose that has been the, after the petals drop off, then it leaves a little apple. And this apple is found way in Arabia. Very expensive. They crush this apple, and when they do, then they get the ointment out of it and put it in this oil. This oil would deteriorate if it wasn't for the sake of the perfume that's in the, uh, that goes into the oil. Now, I think the, the Queen of Sheba brought a lot of that, sometimes called frankincense. And they give them that oil, and they anoint themselves with it, and then wipe it off, and behind their neck, and they smell real good from the, this perfume. Then they got their feet washed, a pair of soft sandals, and oh, they had those great, big, imported Persian carpets on the floor. They really are rich. And when you go in there with these, you wouldn't feel at home with them old dirty feet and stinking and that way if you went into their homes. But they, they fix you up so you feel at home. And then when you're anointed, and then the next thing you do, you're ready to meet your host then. Then you walk into the, the room and you, come here a minute, brother. I'll show you how it's done. When they meet the host, they take hands like this and kiss on that side. Take hands this way. Kiss on that side. Thank you. That's kissing welcome. Do you remember the Bible said, greet the brethren with a holy kiss? That's what it is. They kiss each other on the neck, on both sides of the neck. Then, when you have had your feet washed, now you wouldn't want to meet the host with old dirty sweat all over you, stinking from the road. Neither would you sit in his parlor with those feet and just like almost mud with animal dropping dust and so forth of the manure along the road where your garment is picked up. You would smell bad. So they wash that off. And they give you anointing. And you were all cleaned up. And when you went to meet your host then, he kissed you, and the kiss was a welcome kiss. You wasn't embarrassed when you met your host. You're, you're, you're not embarrassed because you're, you're prepared to meet your host. Or if we only had time to go back and get the gospel meanings of that. But we haven't. We must continue with our little story. How that God prepares His church to meet Him. But that's a real spiritual meaning. But when the host come in then and met the guest, he kissed him. And if the host kissed him, he was a brother then. Anything was in the house wrong to him. Go ahead and sit down on the divan. Go into the icebox and get what you want to eat. Brother, you're just, that's home to you. You're welcome if the host, if the Host kisses, but if he doesn't kiss the, the his person that he has invited, if he doesn't kiss kiss them, then they're not welcome. But when he kisses them, that gives them the welcome. That's why when we are taught in the Bible, greet the brethren with a holy kiss, that is a welcome, a fellowship. See, today we shake hands. Then they kissed on the cheek or on the neck. And when all would be brought in, oh, they were having a great time. And the city was all alarmed. The feast was going on. The cooking was going on. And the outside, only the Easterners will know how they stand. Mm, isn't that wonderful? Oh, my. But there's a fence around them. They can't come into those people's yard, but how they like to see them. And then they go in and I can see our friend, the Pharisee, standing in there and beating the goblets together and drinking a little toast of wine and having a big time. And the party seems to be well on its way. Now, I happen to look Sitting over in the corner, 
not notice, but there sat Jesus with dirty feet, unanointed head, and not even kissed welcome. How did it happen? What happened to that punk at the gate? How did he ever get in there? Oh, I wish I could be that punky. I wish I could have washed his feet. I wish I could have done something about it. How did he ever do it? But there sat Jesus. Unwashed feet. Unanointed head. And not even kissed welcome. But oh, they're having a big time. That's all the world cares about today. Just having a big time. The Bible said kiss the son lest he be angry. Rather this world better humble their old starchy hearts. If the president should come to this city, and I love our president, if he should come to this city, the streets would be full of flags. There'd be a band to meet him. Every house would have a banner fly. The mayor of the city would go out. The best that there is in the city to show him welcome, you would do it. But he's a man. But Jesus can come to your town and he's considered a holy roller. And what can you expect at the end time? Oh, yes. You invite him, sure. But when you buy, invite him, where do you bring him to? In a little room upstairs, the garret. Or go down the basement and have a few little words. And if you're going to get up in the morning and give a prayer meeting this morning, and Susie calls you up and tells you, let's go shopping, Jesus sits on the sidelines. And preacher, you, you call your congregation to pray. Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians, expecting an old-fashioned revival to break out in your town. And some of you Pentecostals, too. And when Jesus comes to town, you tag him as a fanatic and won't even cooperate with it. That's right, you want to have your hands on it? No, sir. How can you expect God to do anything for you? When you turn down the very prince of life, God be merciful. What this nation needs has got a lot of hogs in the water. It needs an old-fashioned washing out. He bases us across the country and people's Harden their hearts to the gospel don't even have any effect on them anymore. I believe the day of grace of this nation is finished. I believe it. Preach, persuade, bring the gospel. It'll never attract them. A little handful of saints will gather up. But the world sits on the sideline and makes fun of it. That's the way you treat him. No wonder he doesn't visit. Jesus only comes where he's welcome. And here he was by the invitation come. But you see the way they were letting him act? He went out, he, you invited him to come. He comes to your church to have a revival. And the first time he does something, you want to put the person out. You want to run him from your church. You don't want him there. He can come in and Heal somebody sick and you'll say, oh, there's no such a thing as that. Now, wait a minute, you're getting all worked up. Some dear saint can get happy and raise up with the tears running down their cheeks and weep in the presence of God. What do you do? <clears throat> Usher, would you see if they get the door? You self-made Pharisee. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> <clears throat> then you think God's going to take you home to heaven. That's the way Jesus is treated. 
happen now. Somebody can come around and say, there ain't nothing that much but a bunch of holy rollers. And you as a minister hold your peace. Oh, brother, how can you do it? And when today the very cause, the very gospel, the very word, the very power of God in a straight gospel power is talked about and made fun of in the city. Letting Jesus sit there with unwashed feet. That's right. Religious people who call themselves religious. Letting the Lord's gospel be treated like that. They don't say a thing, just sit there. Oh, well, I'm Dr. Jones, you know. You're no more than that ungodly Pharisee. You might be doctor, but I don't know what of. But that's it. Notice. There they were sitting there, tipping their glasses together. Oh, you know, I tell you, our great denomination is a growing. I tell you, we've taken in so many members, we did this, that, the other. And Jesus sitting there with our more speed. Stop be merciful. What's happened to people? Why men get so they act like they don't pay attention to it? And women, it's hard to find a woman with enough modesty about her to blush. I haven't seen a blushing woman since I was a kid. That's right. What's the matter? The whole thought of, it, of decency has left the American people. You crack jokes and keep your head and have old televisions and things. No wonder the church is in the condition it is. And your self-made style, Pastor? <laughs> Permitting such as that don't tell you any difference. Jesus wants to come to your home. He wants to heal you. He wants you to love Him. But you won't let Him do it. He wants to come to your church. But all that something back, you set Him back in the corner. He'll not always come, remember. But He's so good. And some of you people that don't go to church, shame on you. Go to church about once a year, and that's on Easter to show you a pretty hat. That's right. But you know what? You, God deserves the first place. Jesus ought to have the first place in every life. But we give Him about the fourth place. He deserves the first place. Well, you say, I pray once today. That's all right. He receives it. If you want to give him fourth place, that's all right. He'll take it. You only went to church once this year, maybe, and wore the new hat and everything, but he never condemns you for it. That's what makes him God to me. If you want to give him fourth place or fifth place, he'll take it. He'll take anything you give him. But he ought to have the first place. He ought to have the best we can give. He ought to have our first, our best, our all. He's deserving of it. Notice now. There he was sitting there, just a wallflower. I say this with respect and not critical. But I say it knowing that I've got to face him someday in the judgment. Jesus Christ is no more than a wallflower in a lot of your big morgues around here. That's right. You're just the only thing he uses his name. He can't come in and be blessed and worshipped by his saints. You won't permit it. You got too early, that's what's the matter. You're too tucked up in something else. Just like old Pharisee was. You're too tucked up in the things of the world. You have to stay and see who loves Susie. You have to see Arthur and Godfrey. Or go down and get Elvis Presley's records and play them. And call yourself Christians. You are weighed in a balance in fair morning. And when you do go to church, just a little sideline of something, don't worship. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. In vain, don't do no good to worship if you worship like that. Jesus said it was in vain. Now look at him sitting there. All the big religious people are standing there tipping their glasses and having a fellowship. And Jesus sitting over in a corner with dirty feet. Oh, God forgive me. When I think of it, Jesus with dirty feet. Oh, my. 
That's why I stepped away from the Baptist church. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. I believe my God ought to be worshipped in the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. I don't believe in your old cold formal creeds. He wants to be loved. Look at him sitting on there. Can't be loved. He can't be loved because of the way he's treated. And that's the same thing today. You self-made seminary chickens of pastors. Hatch yourself out and try to place the dirty name of Holy Roar on the worship of Jesus. No wonder your congregation don't stand for it. It's the way you've treated him. If you would preach the Bible in the power of the resurrection of Christ, saints would be shouting in every church to go to God. Not Jesus' fault, it's your fault. Here he is in Phoenix today. Holy rollers. Bunch of fanatics. Go on, Pharisee. Your times are coming. But notice, way down in the city was a young lady. Let's imagine her now just before closing. Now be real reverent and quiet. This young lady had taken the wrong road. She was a a bad lady. Maybe just a girl. 18, 19 years old. She was a woman of... Oh, well, we don't have to go into details of that. She was of ill fame. And you like to point your finger to her. But let me tell you something, brother. There can't be a bad woman unless there's a bad man to be bad with her. That's right. And don't start her like that. Some mother's darling. I believe instead of pointing to her, if you'd open your church and send somebody to bring her in, there wouldn't be so many of them. Right. Poor little kid. No one loved her. No one cared for her. Society had turned her out and nobody wanted her. So she had to live. And she'd done the best she could, maybe. She was bad. I wouldn't have told her sin, no, sir. All I'm, the, I'm after is the church that won't open a door to her. You don't want her in your society. Who are you anyhow, Pharisee? Right, you're, no, you're worse off than she is many times. Oh, but we couldn't stand Our crowd wouldn't let a woman like that. We couldn't put her in the church membership. Oh, no, no. That's the reason she is what she is. Some mother's darling. Certainly it is. It's the soul that Christ died for. But you're too stiff and starchy. Your society. If I had a society like that in my church, I'd kick them out the door and start it over again with hearts. I sure would. Self-made bunch of educated idiots in this nation. That's right. I don't say that to be mean. But they, they love the praises of man more than the praises of God. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. But you don't want them. Sure, the last call was go get that kind of people. That's a supper call. Notice, there was this little lady, or little woman rather, in her immoral act, she couldn't have been a lady. Lady's a higher name than that. But she was just a prostitute of the street. She smells the food, or a little hungry stomach. She said, wonder what's going on. She goes up around the bend and she looks and she said, oh, look up the Pharisees, the pastor's house. There must be a great host up there at the bishop's house today. Let's just slip up and see what it is. So she goes up and she looks around and says, oh my, that smells so good. I remember when I was a little bitty child, my mother used to cook food like that, but oh, it's been so long since I've eaten like that. And now nobody loves me. I'm just an outcast. I've tucked the wrong road. And oh, I remember mother used to tell me not to do this, but oh, I, mother died and daddy died. And I had no one to look at me. I got with some girls that was bad. Here I am. And she was looking over and she tipped on her toes. She looks up. And she's looking over and there all the pastors are tipping their glasses and oh, talking about the great 
things that's going on in their new members and so forth. And her precious eyes looked over in the corner. She stopped. She said, look like I've seen that man somewhere. Who is that? Oh, that's that Galilean prophet. Oh, I've always wanted to see him. But why don't they pay attention to him? Now, his disciples wasn't invited. They sat on the outside. It was just him invited. You had to be invited. And she looked. The tears begin to run down her cheeks. She wiped her eyes and she looks again. She said, that's him. And look, his feet's dirty. Look at his parched lips and the dirt on his hair and his neck. Oh, they haven't made him lovable. How true that is today. They haven't made him lovable. Oh, all at once something strikes her. Down the street she goes. She runs down the street and up the alley. She gets on this little crickety steps and up she goes. Unlocks her door and goes in. Oh, she said, no, I can't do that. I just can't do that. I must be dreaming. She rubs her eyes again. I can't do that. Oh, then she reaches up in a little cupboard. And she's got a little stocking top up there. She pulls it out. She lays it on the table. She begins to count. Oh, but I can't. I can't. If I would go before him, he'd know what kind of a woman I was. And I couldn't take this money that I've earned in this way. He would know how I got this money. It's not good money in that way. He would know it because I believe that he is the Messiah. Oh, I know they don't treat him right. I know they cast him to one side and there he sets unlovable. But I couldn't take this money and do that. But I, he, he's unlovable. He's dirty. He's got dirty feet. But this is all I got. That's all God requires. You say, I can't come in the life that I live in. Oh, yes, you can. You say, I've drank, I've stole, I've done this, I've lied. I don't care how you are. He wants you just as you are. That's all you have to do. Yes. And he looks. And she says, now, wait a minute. Now, what will they do? Wonder if he'll condemn me. Wonder what'll happen. But something on the inside of her keep giving her courage. It's the right thing to do, something said. It's the right thing to do. Certainly it's the right thing to do. She gets her little stocking of money. She slips it down under her waist. She pulls her little shawl over her face. And down the street she goes. Well, it's almost closing time down at the perfume shop. Everybody's up at fair season. There's a little old Jew sitting in there all sour. Don't this is no good today. Don't know why it is. The door opens. This little soul walks in the door. Well, look who it is. That's what comes in my shop, huh? Well, what do you want? That's about the way some merchants ask me. What do you want? She said, sir, I have come to buy some freaking sense. What do you want, a dime bottle? No, I want the best you got. It's for a very special occasion. That's it. A very special occasion. Oh, we who give one little prayer a day, ten cents, oh, good. This is a rare and a special occasion when we meet Jesus. He just don't want you to be a member of a church. He wants the best you got. Well, I've got it here. But I want to see the money first. No, sure. Here's all that type that said, What profit is to leave Joseph in the grave? 
in the ditch. Make some money out of it, all right. Brother, that thing's got into church. They can make some money out of it, all right. That's not the reason. No, a million times no. I know you think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. But when I think the way that people treat my Lord Jesus is no better than that was back there. No wonder Jesus said the harlots and so forth will come in before you self-righteous. Well, he, she pours the money out on the counter. He counts it. Yep. Just exactly right. 30 pieces of Roman denaria. So he gets up. He says, where are you going to take this? She said, sir, it doesn't matter, does it? As long as you've got your money, what difference does it make? What difference does it make how? What I want to do? As long as I ain't bothering you. She gets her money, her little frankincense box. She sticks it under here, the alabaster box. And she puts it under her coat and her little shawl. And she walks up the street. And she goes up. The devil kept talking to her. Now you're going to get really embarrassed, sure enough. They'll, that Pharisee will put you in jail for doing that. Why, well, they'll throw you out of the house if you shout. <laughs> You'll be excommunicated. Why do you care about excommunication? Get to Jesus is the main thing. She gets up there to the place. She looks over and there he's still sitting. Yeah, he was invited. He come, but nobody paid any attention to him. They was listening to big time, having too much fun. That's what's the matter with America today. It's got too much fun to pay attention to Jesus. Oh, yeah, they like to make light and say, oh, there's no such thing as divine healing. All that speaking in tongues and them other things, that's just all nonsense. We belong to a better class, do you? If you want to call that big bunch of... Actors, imposters, like acting like religion, don't know about religion, or hot and top knows about Egyptian night. You want to belong to that kind of a cult, go ahead. But I want to get with a bunch of lights to get to Jesus. That's the main thing. Get to Him. She stops. She looks around, and there's some of the big self-righteous dudes standing out there. Points and says, hey, look who come up to the feast. Look at that. See, look at that. There she is. Yeah, that's the way some of these buzzards today. They like to point their finger to somebody like that, but never give them a hand out to help them to get to Christ. You're talking about the fallen, brother. Jesus died to save the fallen. That's true. Then I see the little fella as she stands there looking around. She thought, how can I get to him? Oh, look at him sitting there. He's so unwelcome. How he is today, right in Phoenix, unwelcome. I noticed in the brother's church this morning while the little fellow was standing there, the little shepherd trying to feed his flock right next door, spading and working and everything else. Oh, he walked out, you're in half-dressed women, this park here, some of them with overcoats on, the other one with little bitty short clothes on like a handkerchief tied around them up here, some of them old wrinkled grandmas and everything else. Oh, we're very religious, oh, you self-styled Pharisees. I don't know what's the matter with me. When I noticed this little fella, oh, she said, if I can just get to him, I'll change this picture. She begins to nudge her way through. Here she comes. She's determined to get to Jesus. Brother, that's what I like about it. I don't care what the outside world says. Let's get to Jesus. The main thing. She moves through the crowd as she's pushing them right and left. She runs right into the sight of Jesus. Oh, and she stands by him. The devil begins to say, Now he's going to rebuke you, but not one word. Now the way they eat them is a little different from now. We set up and eat them. They laid down and eat sideways. You kiddies were right in the beginning. So they laid down and was eaten. And she ran right to the end of this couch where Jesus was laying. I can see her as she stands there and she looks up at him. All of her sins comes before her. Brother, you can never look in his face and not feel guilty. She sees all of her sins, her ill living, her ill fame, how they all are right before her. 
and she starts crying. She looks at his dirty feet. She knows it shouldn't be that way. And she begins to weeping so much for her sins until the tears begin to drop upon his feet. And she takes his feet up like this and she begins to rub them. Oh my! What did Pharisee do? Oh, he stuck his chest out. My! He blew up like a frog-eating shot. As he looks over, somebody broke up the party. Why, who cares about the party? As long as you can get to Jesus, who cares about what's going on? She wanted to get to Jesus. And there at his feet, look what beautiful water. Jesus had his feet washed. What beautiful water, the sparkling tears of a penitent sinner. I believe for the first time since Jesus spent the feast, he felt at home. Jesus feels more at home with a repentant harlot than he would in your big, fine, classy church the way you're treating him. That's right. She's repenting. The tears are running down her cheeks and on his feet. And she's washing his feet with the tears. And she's kissing his feet. Sure she did. She didn't care what anybody thought. She was in the presence of Jesus. What did she care about her action? Her heart was just pouring out the fountains of repentance. What beautiful water for his feet. She was washed. And she was so hysterically, I was too. I was too when I got this present. I got hysterically. I didn't care what anybody else thought. I know they said I was a holy roller, but I don't care. I was before Jesus. <laughs> I didn't care if they excommunicated me from the church. I was in the presence of Jesus. She was washing his feet. Oh, I'd love to be there, wouldn't you? And they were standing, and Pharisee nudged the other one, said, Now, if he is a prophet, he didn't know what that woman was. Now, I'm going to show that he don't know what he's talking about. We told you. He didn't know. Let's watch him a minute. And all the time, she's kissing his feet. Kissing his feet because she's repenting. The tears are flowing down. And all at once, her hair she had done up on top of her head, the curls all fell down around her. And she stops and takes this alabaster box and she didn't break it. She takes it again and she just pours the whole thing over on him. All that she's got. And with tears and oil, she was washing his feet and kissing the grease all over her mouth. And her hair falls down and she picks up the curls. And she sets his feet up against the wife him with her hairs of her head. Just kissing his feet, kissing his feet, kissing his feet. Oh, sure, the celebrity was there. All the society of the city was there. She looked like she was out of her head. Maybe she was. But she is at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. People may act like they're crazy, but what difference does it make? If you're at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> what do I care what they think? She is at Jesus' feet. She was kissing him. Pharisee, oh my, he was ready to blow up. Then Jesus turns and he looks. Oh, I can see those eyes. As he turns that sacred head, he knows the thoughts of Pharisee. He said, Simon... I've got something to talk to you about. Oh, you Pharisee, one of these days that's coming to you. I've got something to talk to you about. You invited me here. And you never give me any water for my feet. And you never anointed my head when I come in. Neither did you kiss me welcome. But this poor sinner, 
Ever since I've been sitting here, she's done nothing but wash my feet with her tears, wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kiss my feet ever since I've been in here. Oh, Pharisee changed a little bit. He looked over. Now the woman's scared. Oh, what's he going to say? Is he going to condemn her? Did he jerk his foot back and say, don't do that? No, Jesus, don't do things that way. No, no. He never pulled his foot back. Oh, no, sir. He sat right still and watched her. She was doing for him what they ought to have done. And you be careful calling somebody a holy roller who's doing what you ought to have done. You think you're just a little better than they are now. Now, look. There was Pharisee, the bishop of the church, with all the pastors and elders standing around, thought themselves too good to touch this holy roller. But this poor little woman standing there now, what's she going to receive? Oh, she noticed she loved him. Something happened. Had she done wrong? No, he said one day, whosoever will, let him come. They wouldn't do it. So she wanted to do it. If these big starches won't worship God, God will pour out you poor people. He'll get you to do it. Somebody, he'll call us sinners and harlots and from the street to do it. Somebody's going to worship God. Now look at the little woman. She startled. Her big brown eyes, as beautiful as he was, looked up. Then he turns after looking at Pharisee. Grease all over her face. Her tears had washed down her face. Her hairs were hanging in the street. There she was. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? And then he said, Simon, I come at your invitation. You invited me. You never wash my feet. You never give me anointing oil for my hands and my neck. And you never kiss me welcome. But this poor sinner has constantly kissed my feet. Then he turns and looked at the little woman. He said, and verily I say unto you. <laughs> verily I say unto you, her sins which were many are all taken away. Oh, brother, I, I'm not a baby, but when I think, I'd rather have him to say that to me than to make me the archbishop or the pope of Rome. Your sins, which were many, has all been washed away. Go in peace. I just can't preach no more. Let's bow our heads just a minute. Lord Jesus, oh, to this cruel world, self-styled, a lot of glamour, and here you are in the last days, moving among the people, and they laugh and write you up dirty in the newspapers and everything else in magazines, when they should be washing your feet. Be merciful, dear God. Wayward men and women today don't realize, God, they can't realize, that this self-same Jesus is looking right at them now. How self-styled church members will all their pomp and self sit around and criticize and make fun and don't know that the very Jesus that'll judge them someday they're talking about him, making fun of him, calling him bad names. God let men and women today in this auditorium, if there be some self-styled church members, or maybe from the street as the woman was, may they come sweetly and humbly to your feet and wash away all the reproach by their testimony to the public. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Granted, Father, while we have our heads bowed and your eyes closed, 
I'm going to ask you something in the name of Christ the Savior. Here he is, come to Phoenix to visit you. Comes nightly and heals the sick. Speaks to you, tells you who you are, what you've done. Just the same as he did God, by always willing to forgive you and love you. Oh, may God be merciful. How many here really feels your guilt of neglecting him? Place him off in some little corner, somewhere of a little two-minute prayer a day, or maybe never read his word once a week, yet you belong to church. And you say, I'm sorry that I've done Jesus that way. I want to repent right now. Will you raise up your hand? Say, Christ, I want to repent. Oh, God bless you. There's at least a hundred hands up. You feel that you've mistreated the Lord Jesus. I don't care what church you belong to. That doesn't matter. Might be Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Lutheran. That doesn't matter. Have you realized that you've mistreated Jesus? And you know you're guilty. You don't pray. You don't worship Him. Would you like to walk up here at the altar just now with me? And say, Lord, from this day on, I'll take you. I want to serve you from today on with a true reverent heart. I'll wait on you. Move right up out of your seat. Now with your head bow the rest. Just give them room as they walk out. I want to see every person raise their hands and those who are convinced that you've mistreated him. Would you just stand here for a word of prayer then you go right back to your seat. Just before we close. To the grace of God it was a woman who made the first start. Now the men are following. God bless you. Little lady repenting here that I just want to worship him. Let your supper go. Why do you care? Come here. Sister, brother, this means more to you than going to supper. This may mean going to heaven. It may mean life eternal. I don't care if you're Pentecost, Baptist, whatever you are. I don't matter. Come up here. Come here. You know you've mistreated him. Come on up. My Indian friends here, bless your hearts. I want to go to Apache Reservation. I'll be back. I'll come up there. Won't you come if you missed you up in the balcony? Don't think you're too far away. You may be plumbing hell someday and then you'll be too far away. You're not this afternoon. Will you come? That's right. Move right up. How two deaf and dumb boys walking up. Just the sign language. And some of you that God's been good enough to give you your hearing. And then you'd sit back on a sideline. Oh, God. Well, you say, look here, preacher, I've got a Ph.D. I don't care what you got. you got a stony heart, too. You better worship him while you can. Kiss the son while you can, lest he be angry. I want to kiss him in my heart. Two young men got up out of the balcony, come walking down, just young men. Won't you come? We're waiting. Do you want to kiss the sun? Do you want to stand here by his side and say, Lord Jesus, with all my heart, I'm sorry the way I've done. I've been a church member. Yes, that's right. But I never really treated you right. I open my tears to wash your feet. With my testimony, I want to give a sweet-smelling Savior to you. I want to tell the world that I love you. I've been afraid in my office. I've been afraid of my neighbor. I'm afraid she might not like me no more. But Jesus, I don't care who likes me as long as you like me. Every man's immortal. He's going to die like you are. But Christ is immortal. Won't you come? Just as I
the laity is standing here, I'm going to ask how many preachers will walk up here with me. I want to see what you're made out of. I put myself up here at the altar too. I'm guilty. I want God's forgiveness. I'm God bless you, men and women. Now listen, pastors, ladies, and men both. There's one thing that I know you're guilty of here in Phoenix. You're guilty of not having the right kind of fellowship. Aren't you ashamed? Aren't you ashamed the way you treated him? Just look at the preachers. Both men and women. Oh, God. Are you really sorry in your heart? How many of you are really sorry the way you treated Jesus? Raise up your hand. With my hands up to God, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of myself. There's been a many a place I could have gone and wouldn't, didn't go. There's been a many things I could have done and didn't do it. I thought I was too tired. But while I was preaching today, something said to me, what about you? I preached it right to myself. Jesus was invited to the Pharisee. Tired and weary and it so hurt him. But he went anyhow, knowing he's going to be unwelcome. He went anyhow. I'm ashamed of myself. I repent. I repent before God in this audience. And if you'll repent, brethren, with all your heart and sisters, I'm sure that Christ who stands in our presence will forgive us. And we'll have a fellowship here in Phoenix like it was on the day of Pentecost. Every one of you brothers just break down your little barriers now. <laughs> just forget all about it. Whether you're assemblies or church of God or Baptists or Presbyterian or Oneness or what, Trinitarians or whatever you are, just forget all about it. Let's just worship the Lord Jesus. Now the rest of you stand all over the building everywhere. Do you really mean you'll do it? Raise up your hands to God. I'll do it. By the grace of God, I'll do it. Now as you take your hands down, shake hands with somebody by you and say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Walk around, shake each other's hands and say, God bless you, brother. All around everywhere. I'm sorry I treated you the way I do. If you got any enmity, go to your man right now and make it right. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Barrier, 
Say any wrong denomination, but I'll, I'll be glad to shake hands with my brother, though he's different with me. I'll cooperate. I'll do everything I can to further the cause of Christ. You will be willing to do it. Raise your hand. Say, I'll do it. I'll do it by the grace of God. I believe you. Oh, precious is that love that makes me right and What about around the altar? You feel good? Feel all our sins are washed away. What can wash away all sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not joining in another denomination, but the blood of Jesus. Oh, return in peace to your homes. God be with you. Go to your churches. Support it. Stand behind your pastor. Stand behind the programs of God. And pray for your pastor. And let's have a real old-fashioned revival sweep Phoenix. It won't be long to Brother Roberts and Brother Allen and many more of the men that comes to you. be back in. When they come, everybody with one heart go out and cooperate and have a great big time. Don't proselyte. Just go to your own church and worship God. When the service is over, invite them all to your church. If the other fellow don't keep his word, that's up between him and God. You keep your word to God. That's the main thing. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, I can make me oh, all yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank you. Is that so that? the breakfast the other morning, I said God's heritage started up in a stump. Every time it did, the palmer worm began to eat the caterpillar. I said, someday God would come with an insect spray. He'll spray love around that tree so no caterpillar can get to it. That's right. I believe he's doing it right now, don't you? Yes, sir. What is it? The whole body of the Lord Jesus. All you Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Oneness, Tunis, whatever you are, the love of Jesus Christ shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost make us brothers and sisters. Our sins are washed away by the blood. How wonderful. How we thank God. First, that's good. Come here a minute. Is this all right? Amen. This man who's been with me in Africa seen tens of thousands and thousands come to Christ at one time. Brother Julius Sedgcliffe. I'm going to ask you to offer prayer for this audience. Then we're going to go home just in a little bit. Do you have a word to say, brother? Anything to do? 7.30 tonight is the services. God willing, we'll be here. Prayer cards will be given out in the next... What time do you get? 6.30. Come down. I hope we have a great outpouring for the healing tonight. Bring in your sinner friends. I'll be preaching to you again in the next couple of hours. The Lord willing, slip out now and get you a little lunch and come back. Closing of the service. Now, if your pastor is uh, got his doors open tonight, you go to your church. That's your post of duty. If you belong to the assemblies, go to the assemblies. If you belong to the United, go to the United. If you whatever church you belong to, you take your post of duty tonight. I'm an evangelist. See? And if you if they close for the night, you come on down, be with us. And then if you're here without a church, you come on tonight, you go into the restaurant eat, invite the waitress then to come out tonight. We hope to see you. Until then, I felt led. My dear friend here has been with me through many trials and troubles and ups and downs. I wanted to dismiss the word of prayer. God bless you, Brother Judas, while you bow your head.